Welcome to the Eden Podcast, where we true the verse of Genesis 3.16, and we discover that God didn't curse Eve or Adam or limit woman in any way. This is Think Again Thursday. I'm Bruce E. Fleming, Executive Director of the True 316 Foundation. Our website is true316.com. That's tru316.com. And we're the home of the Eden Podcast. On Think Again Thursdays, we're working through, right now, the Book of Eden, and we're up to chapter seven, seven chapters out of eight. And in this chapter, we're going to look specifically at the Hebrew words in Genesis 3.16. We've looked at the patterns in the surrounding passages. We've looked at how this verse is linked to the other verses around it. But right now, we want to dive deep right into the 11 Hebrew words that God uses. This is from Joyce, my wife, Dr. Joy Fleming, from her doctoral dissertation that she did in Strasbourg, France. So you're going to notice some references to France and to Africa in the middle of the book here. And now you know where that came from. All right, let's get started with chapter seven in the book of Eden. What comes to your mind when I say the words natural childbirth? In the months before we left our studies in France beside the Rhine River to head for the rainforests of the Congo, we learned that we were pregnant with our first child. Friends counseled it that it might be counseled us that it might be difficult to have to deliver our first little one on an isolated missionary station somewhere in the Ubangi. So we set out to prepare ourselves as best we could. A few blocks from our student apartment, we found a bookstore. We bought several books in French about natural childbirth. Nothing was available in English, but we were in France after all, and this was in the days before the internet. Joy and I worked hard to understand the specialized vocabulary. We were in France, for, after all, trying to learn French, and these were specialized words that we had never been taught before in any of our classes. The emphasis seemed to be on concentrated breathing exercises. Well, that was no surprise. This was the country of Dr. Lamaz. Joy was six months pregnant when we finally arrived in hot, steamy Africa. Right away, we noticed the happiness in everyone's faces when they saw we were pregnant. Well, that Joy was pregnant. In Europe and America, having babies brings about a positive response from family and friends, but less so from strangers. This was certainly not true where we lived in Africa. Having babies was considered to be wonderful, and everybody thought things were just great for us. Well, we looked forward to the birth of our child as well. We didn't know if we were having a boy or a girl. We had tried to find out at the public hospital in France, but results were inconclusive. Finally, Joy gave birth to our first child in a mission hospital in the rainforests of northwestern Congo around sunset on a Sunday evening. After 36 hours of exhausting contractions, Joy was invited to ride in the cab of the doctor's pickup truck, and he drove them over to the hospital. I walked along behind. A flock of red-tailed gray African parrots flew overhead, I noticed. Palm trees stood sentinel duty, and a 10-foot-high termite hive was tinted pink by the setting sun. There was no ultra-modern delivery room available. The setting was more like a field hospital during World War II. But that was the best they had, and we were grateful for it. On the short trip, the doctor stopped at the small powerhouse to start the diesel power generator. At least we would have lights on and a rotating overhead fan during delivery to to try to fight the heat in that stifling room. The medical staff was superb. The lead doctor was ably assisted by two other doctors, a husband and wife team. They were both Harvard Med School grads. Plus, there were several fine nurses in attendance. A nurse and I stood on either side of Joy as we timed her breathing. She received no medication of any kind. I admired her great effort, which was followed by exhaustion and exhilaration, as Joy gave birth to our wonderful baby girl, Christy. Was it a cursed experience, I asked Joy, as we looked back on it the next morning? No, it wasn't, but it certainly required a lot of effort. Conception and pregnancy. By the way, Christy, she is the announcer on the Eden podcast, so you you know her voice. Conception and pregnancy was intended to be a good and natural process when God created woman. Even after Satan's attack, their disobedience, and the beginning of living life in their now mortal bodies, the promise of future conception and pregnancy was a good and natural event. It remains a good and natural event. God does not change the woman's body as he speaks to her in Eden. Yet, modern translations make it appear that God somehow zaps the woman, changing childbirth into a bad thing. (laughs) 
To understand Genesis 3.16, we must recognize that in God's first words to the woman in line one of Genesis 3.16, God didn't even touch on the subject of childbirth. One, God spoke to her about shared sorrowful toil, it's a bone, in field work. And two, God spoke to her about conception or pregnancy, her own, and especially of the offspring who had bruised Satan's head. The way the words are put together in the chiasm of Genesis chapters 2 and 3 carries meaning, and the way verses 15 to 17 are linked together in a linchpin construction by the two key words in line 1 of Genesis 3.16 brings meaning. But the meaning of each word itself is also important, and that's what we're going to look at. In the two words of the linchpin construction that link God's words to her with God's words to the man and to the serpent, the woman learns two things. Neither of them is a curse on her. One thing is about bad news. One thing is about good news. The bad news, she learns, is that when God curses the ground because of the man, it will affect her too. They both will experience it's a bone or sorrowful toil as they do field work to raise food from the cursed ground outside of Eden. God knows they will be going there and what life there will be like. So God describes to her what her experience will be like with the cursed ground. She will have it's a bone. She will have sorrowful toil. And that's bad news. But God immediately moves on to tell her of good news. How can the words of Genesis 3.16 be taken as good news right after God's stern judgment on the serpent tempter? Simple math. Three of the four words in line one ring of good news. Here are the four Hebrew words of line one. Harba, Arba, Itzibonek, Veheronek. Multiplying, I will multiply, your sorrowful toil, and your conception. Genesis 3.16, line one. What's happening here? God acts. We don't see action like this in the other lines in the verse. So this is important. Genesis 3.16, line one. This is where God acts. A-C-T-S. The first two words of line one in 3.16 are harba, arba. This is the repetition of a single Hebrew verb to multiply. And it comes out this way. Multiplying, I will multiply. This same verb in this same verbal construction, which is repeated for emphasis, will be used in association with God's blessing on the seed or offspring, Zerah, of Abraham later in Genesis. When God blesses Abraham for being willing to sacrifice his son Isaac, God first repeats the word to bless for emphasis, then God repeats the word to multiply for emphasis, as in Genesis 3.16. God also uses this verb and verbal construction of multiplying. I will multiply your descendants, Harba, Arba, Zerah, when God speaks to Hagar in Genesis 16. God says to Abraham in Genesis 22, 17, blessing, I will bless you. Catch the repetition. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants, Zerah, as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. Suppose there'd been someone who was familiar with God's blessing on Abraham, who has somehow never come across the chapter's on the Garden of Eden. When they did eventually come to God's repetition of the verb to multiply in Genesis 3.16, they would have expected the word seed or offspring, Zerah, to come next. In Genesis 3.16, we might expect God to say to the woman that he will greatly multiply her descendants, Zerah, Harba Arba Zerah, as God says to Abraham and to Hagar. Well, we find this, but in the form of a linchpin. The word Zerah is used just a few words earlier in verse 15, as the words point back to the first mention of the gospel. In 316, a similar word that fits the sound pattern better, in 316, heron is used. Though, <clears throat> therefore, in words one, two, and four of line one, God says, multiplying, I will multiply your heron. Heron means your conception or your pregnancy. Harbe, arbe, your heron. It's wonderful to hear from God that she will assuredly have offspring. God had blessed her and the man on day six of creation. And what did God say? Be fruitful and multiply. And it is wonderful to hear from God that assuredly she will have offspring so that she can fulfill the promise that her offspring will defeat her attacker, Satan. It's almost startling to recognize what God clearly says to the woman. We have become so used to thinking of her oh, deserving special punishment as if she was the temptress, which she was not, that it's hard for us to focus on what God actually says. 
God gently warns her in advance of the coming curse on the ground. And then God completes the announcement of the Protevangelium of the good news and glorious gospel that she will yet bear offspring who will defeat Satan. When God introduces her to the sorrowful toil or itzabon she will experience outside of Eden, God is not telling her about something reserved for her because she's a woman. It's not just for her and not for the man. The man will experience this exact same sorrowful toil or itzabon because it's something God will do to the ground because of him. They both will have sorrowful toil because of the curse on the ground God will make because of the man. Noah's father used this same word in Genesis 5, 29. There, it's a bone is described as something both he and his wife are experiencing. All these years after the Garden of Eden, people are thinking of this specific sorrowful toil that's bothering them because of the curse on the soil. It's the sorrowful toil, they say, of our hands in working the cursed ground, he says. Genesis 3.16, lines 2 to 4. What's happening here? God is not acting. God is instructing. With these mostly positive first four Hebrew words in mind in line 1, can we concentrate on what God says next? Let's try to keep in mind the two actions God promised to take in line 1 and then get ready for the next three lines God says to her in Hebrew. The two things God tells her about in line 1 are Say it with me. We can, it should be clear by now. One, sorrowful toil in fieldwork. And two, conception. In lines two, three, and four, God tells the woman about how things have turned out as the result of Satan's attack on them and their disobedience. In these three lines, God instructs the woman. God looks at the various areas of her life and tells her things she needs to know. God's words to the woman in verse 16, lines 2 to 4, are words of instruction. They are words of description and of teaching. God also knows that she's married to a dead man. Her husband was a willful participant in the great disobedience. Clear signs are showing how badly his relationships with God and his wife have been corrupted. Very soon, they will find themselves outside of Eden with the way back barred by armed angel warriors. With supreme urgency and maximum use of every word, God instructs the woman in lines two, three, and four. Two things will have changed which will have a physical impact on the woman, her mortality, and the curse on the ground. There is now death, and she has a mortal body. This consequence of sin was foretold in Genesis 2.17. Two, there will be the curse on the ground. She will experience sorrowful toil, which will be the result of a sec separate act of God, Genesis 3.17. Having disobeyed God's prohibition, her body is now subject to difficulty and death, but God does not curse her body as God just did the serpent. The changes she will experience from these other two causes uh, come from these other two causes rather than a curse or a, a zap from God. The changes will come about, one, because she's now mortal, and two, because the ground will be cursed. Well, what about line two of Genesis 3.16? In line two of Genesis 3.16, God does not bring up the act of childbirth. Line one of 3.16 did not refer to pain in childbirth, even though you might read it there in some translations. And line two does not refer to pain in childbirth either. Modern translations have gotten so caught up in their inventions that they make God seem to stutter, talking twice about delivering babies, saying once in line two and somehow back in line one, something about childbirth. But that's not what God says. God acts in line one in two ways that we've noted. And in lines two through four, God describes her life as mother and wife in a sinful world. The first Hebrew word in line two is ba'etzeb. It means with grief or with psychological sorrow. This word is used elsewhere in the Old Testament. And elsewhere, etzeb never describes anything to do with the act of childbirth. A look at the next Hebrew word helps us understand what is being described in talking about psychological sorrow. That word is teldi, which is a form of the verb yalad. In Genesis 4.18, we find yalad used describing a string of generational relationships. The King James Version quaintly used the verb begat. The New King James Version used begat. The New International Version translates it this way, was the father of. As in, Methusael was the father of Lamech. Plug this into Genesis 3.16b and we get, in grief, you will be the mother of children. 
Grief was experienced all too soon as she parented her first two children. In Genesis 4, we learn that Cain offered an unacceptable sacrifice, while Abel worshipped in a way that pleased God. Disappointingly, Cain then uttered rebellious and defiant words to God. Next, he murdered her second child, Abel. He even continued to utter defiant words as God imposed his punishment. Certainly, as Eve became aware of all this, she grieved deeply. In spite of this bad news, there is a word of good news in line two. It is the last word, children. Children is good news. The woman can still fulfill God's creation mandate from day six, recorded in Genesis 1, to be fruitful and multiply. She will bear more than one child. The plural word is used. She will have children. Thus far, God has used a collective singular word in line one of 316, and in 315, they can mean just one or possibly a number of. The offspring, Zerah of 315, and the pregnancy, Heron of 316, might have meant she would have just one child. But at the end of line two in 316, God uses the word banim. It is the plural word for children. When you hear im, that's like an S in Hebrew. After her firstborn child, she will bear more. She'll have at least two children for sure, and likely more as God's blessing is worked out, and she bears children who will fill the earth. She will fulfill the creation mandate of Genesis 1.28 and she will have multiplied offspring and will defeat her attacker. Okay, what about line three of Genesis 3.16? God's going to teach some more. In line three, God looks into her heart. God instructs her on the state of her heart and contrasts it with the state of her husband's heart. How much has changed for her in the paradise she lives in? Patiently, lovingly, God instructs her on the state of her heart. Her affection is still for her husband. This is implied in just two Hebrew words. One is your desire, which the Hebrew word is teshuka, and the other word is to your husband. No verb is used here. When this happens in Hebrew, the verb to be or is is typically inserted in English. So her desire is. What kind of desire is this? There's every reason to assume this is a healthy desire as she had before the attack. And God says her desire is still the same. Some have attempted to compare her desire in 3.16 to another desire depicted in the word picture in Genesis 4.7. But the verse in 4.7 is outside the tightly constructed chiasm of which 3.16 is a part. It is outside of the passage of 2.4 to 3.24. The desire mentioned in Genesis 4 is only part of the next passage. What we learn from that occurrence is that the word desire, teshuka, is not necessarily a term reserved for human affection because it's used in a non-sexual way in the account of Cain and Abel. The word teshuka is used only one other time in the Old Testament. It's helpful to our understanding because it describes another human. In Song of Solomon 7.10, teshuka is used to describe Solomon. His lover refers to Solomon's desire in these words, I am my beloved's and his desire is toward me. There, there's no negative connotation to his desire for his lover. The word desire is not used for the man when God refers to him in line four of Genesis 3.16. God's evaluation of the woman's heart will serve as a measuring point when the state of the man's heart is compared to the loving desire of his wife. It's not so easy for modern readers to simply recognize her desire as her affection. This is because many, many people have identified her as a shameless temptress, a ravening beast who led the man to his death and deserved a curse. If that were truly the case, then in line three of 316, we could expect God to talk about how terrible her heart has become. Theologians have actually taught this. H.C. Leupold said in his commentary that the woman had a morbid yearning. He and others have said even this, that she was a nymphomaniac, based on this verse. Notice the confusion that the following translations reveal. I'm going to take a look at these with you. When it comes to line three and line in 316, many translations assume her desire was somehow bad. They can't agree on what way her desire was bad, but they freely invent interpretations of the meaning of desire. So I'll give you a representative sampling of the translations of 316. <clears throat> From the English Standard Version, they say, your desire shall be contrary to your husband. 
New Living Translation, you will desire to control your husband. They get that from the verb. Well, there is no verb. Huh. Let's back up. English Standard Version, your desire shall be contrary to your husband. New Living Translation, your desire to control your husband. International Standard Version, since your trust is turning toward your husband. Net Bible, you will want to control your husband. Yet you will long for your husband, says God's word translation. The Brenton Septuagint translation says, and thy submission shall be to thy husband. And the Douay Bible says, and thou shalt be under thy husband's power. Where did all these ideas come from? Remember, the two Hebrew words in line three simply say, your desire is to your husband. And the meaning is straightforward. She's not turned against her husband. She still desires him. What about line four of 316? In line four, God describes the state of the man's heart. The man's heart now. The Hebrew words in lines three and four practically vibrate with tension as the man's heart is contrasted with the woman's heart. The man's heart is very different. God tells the woman, he will rule, the verb is mashal, over you. Unlike line three, where God described the woman using a noun and the preposition to or toward, here we encounter adversarial words. In line four, a preposition and a verb, not a noun, are used to describe the man. The verb is mashal or rule. The preposition is over. In line three, the preposition used for the woman is to or toward, suggesting a relationship of equal partners. In line four, an aggressive adversarial verb is used along with the preposition over. The, ru the words rule and over stand in marked contrast to the affection of the noun and preposition attributed to the woman in the preceding line. This verb for rule in line four is not the same Hebrew verb that was used in Genesis 1, even though it looks the same for English readers because translations use the same English word for the two different Hebrew verbs. When God commanded the man and the woman to rule over the rest of creation in Genesis 1.28, the verb rada was used. This was a legitimate ruling, sometimes called the creation mandate. The humans were to be in charge of all creation. When the man's prospective action in 3.16 is described, however, the verb mashal is used. And this is the same verb that is used to describe the ugly ruling over perpetrated by the Philistines over the Israelites in Judges 14.4. Line 4 describes a relationship that is not the equal partnership God instituted in Genesis 2, this is one person lording it over the other. God describes this as what will go on. He does not say it is his will for it to happen. These words are descriptive, not prescriptive. God does not give a command to the man to go and rule over the woman in line four of 316. God is not even speaking to the man in 316. In lines two to four, God has been telling the woman about life after the attack with psychological sorrow she will be the mother of children her desire is to her husband on that she's not changed but the man has changed but he will rule over you the man has aligned himself with a murderous liar who spoke to them through the serpent he has hidden the tempter's part in their eating the fruit of the tree he has accused god and blamed her of being the cause of his rebellion and now god warns her that she's married to the most sinful man in the world that sinner rejected God's rule and started ruling over himself, going his own way. And he was going to continue to reject God's rule over him and over her. The man was going to usurp God's place in ruling over her, and he was going to rule over her himself. Have you known the Bible says these things in 316? It does. But most people aren't getting its message because of the mistranslations and misinterpretations of it. That's why we founded the True 316 Foundation and True316.com. And that's why we're praying for people to be raised up to correct our translations of 316 and more. God's word is a pure source of life to people worldwide, but we need to remove the word pollution that's harming those who come to the Bible expecting to be refreshed and instead are repulsed by the pollution they find. We need the true message of Genesis 316. True 316 Foundation is the home of the Eden Podcast. Join us for $3.16 a month or more. Let's chew the verses on the key passages on women and men. 
Go to true316.com slash partner.